A few weeks later, I then received a reply from the former Lost Media Society admin. The one who said to be attempting to collect the lost episodes. He told me he was not aware of the Aristocats lost episode version, but there was he was nevertheless now in possession of several lost episode copies, and was willing to show them to me for a price. To be exact, he wanted a thousand dollars. I agree without hesitation. I was not going to get a point in anywhere in my life. Where could I comfortably spend a thousand dollars on anything, to let alone prospect that might not deliver? But I was afraid of talking getting down you know, to lower the offer would make him break the contract, and something in my gut told me his claims were at least sincere. He, ga he gave me the address of the secluded cabin that he said he would rent there for purpose, which was several states away. He said to me to come alone. He gave me a exact date and expected me to be there. When I was being put off by his curt tone, but figured that his paranoia of someone stealing his collection or worse, being hunted down by the people who made the items, I prepared for the trip and left immediately. When I arrived at the state where the cabin was, there was still a couple of days until the meeting date, so I checked into a hotel. I was up late, watching TV, be in my room, room with the lights off, and when I found the channel playing the Aristocats, it was in the middle of the movie, but I kept watching. I grew nervous as I already watched the whole movie, and knew there was nothing wholesome in the standard version, but the setting alone in the dark with just the light off the TV was strongly rim-scented of my traumatic virgin experience with the to big feature. Soon my unease turned to, out to be comfort. I realized that there was nothing to fear. Sure, at this point, I was convinced that somewhere out there existed a violent and twisted version of the Aristocats one, which had been unfortunate, though, due to somehow seen as a child. But that didn't matter. It couldn't hurt me now. I just laughed as I realized now I had the chance to relive my memory without the trauma. So I grabbed the snack and continued watching in the dark. For once able to enjoy the film, I was in tea to be enjoyed. I was able to appreciate such a great, truly great how movie it was. How much effort was put into the animation, voices, and even how great the music was. The soundtrack was a little distorted though, so I turned up the volume to hear it better, and I realized that it wasn't the TV. The music became faster and more distorted, and the scene began morphing into an abstract images. I heard screams from the TV. Disturbing images were too brief to make out clearly flashed on the screen. This was all and ended with the image of Burlaz, the one I saw on the internet with his eyes bloodshot. On the image, there were two words that were in all caps, STOP ASKING. The screen then went to black. I sat in total darkness, my body quaking, tears and snot running down from my face, hardly able to catch my breath. I turned on the lights and threw up in the bathroom, switched the channel, and all the stations were playing the normal television, which was somewhat comforting, but I had to check out of the hotel and went to a different one. At this point, I was considering on giving up the hunt. My first goal had been to find out if the lost episodes are real, and I had certainly achieved that at least, wherever it was going further and finding out the exact nature and the origin of them was worth it, and was becoming increasingly a Oblivious said prospect. Whoever was behind them had powers and resources to seriously threaten me, and I didn't even know if the full closure was worth risking my neck any further. But at the end, I had to keep going though. I was close now, and if there was some secret, powerful group behind all these lost episode stories, the world needed to know. Who are they, and to try to intimidate me into giving up? No, I wouldn't give up on the hunt. At that moment, I have doubled down in my determination. At the appointed time, I had showed up at the cabin. It was night, and the moon had flooded my lonely cabin with the eerie glow. There was a vehicle in the driveway, but the lights were out, and there was no other signs of occupancy. I timidly walked up and knocked on the door. Without turning on my lights, the man greeted me. For his own safety, I will not describe the man to say what appeared middle-aged. So you were curious about this. Good. Do you have the memory? I gave him the wallet of cash, and I turned on the lamp to count it, 
and then motioned for me to follow him into the other room. He closed the door behind me before turning on the light, and the room had a high ceiling and nature paintings on the wall, along with a single shelf and old books that were clearly there for decoration. Centered in front of me was the walls that were painted in plasma tele huge plasma television. There was a lot of space, but the man himself had only had a couple chairs and some plastic storage tubs on the floor. So here's my collection. It ain't very big, but you'll have a hard time finding these items anywhere else. Sorry to have to charge you so much, but you gotta realize I'm taking a huge risk showing this stuff to a stranger, so you gotta make it worth my while. I trembled in anticipation. At last, I was able to have some real considerate answers. Like I said in my email, I don't have nor have previously heard of the Aristocats video made by these people, but from what you described it, I completely believe you saw it. If it fits right in with all the kinds of things they would make, he continued. But hey, you mean Lost Media Group, I interjected. Yeah, they would have been behind the thing you saw, along with that Batman Lost episode if it indeed exists. Though I hadn't been able to find the episode myself again, wouldn't be surprised. I know I, what their goal in is to making these things, but they're investigating as hell so I could collect them. I asked if we could share some of his contacts, but he flatly refused. I only give out the information to trusted friends, and even if you were one of them, I would make you pay even more than you could afford. Please don't ask me that again. You're lucky I even agreed to show you my collection. I was a little flustered by his tone, so I just nodded. Then we got down to business. He opened one of the tubs and pulled out a VCR, along with a black VHS tape with a light label that read Pink Panther in black Sharpie. He looked up at the VCR and inserted the tape and played. It was a lost episode from the Pink Panther cartoon series, which was now consist of short sketches for about five or six minutes each with Pink Panther going on various solo adventures and getting into trouble with other characters and situations, which he manages to a superior mastery of cartoon physics. There was never any dialogue, save for the occasional wordless exclamation or babbled nonsense, like in the Tom and Jerry cartoons, and every short has the Pink Panther theme playing throughout. I had to watch a little of the show as a kid, but I didn't really have that me many memories of it. The episode was called Forty Shades of Pink, which I assume, assume it was a pun how Ireland said to have forty shades of green. Since this was St. Patrick's Day fiend episode, it took place in a green land that, while not explicitly identified as Ireland, was obvious to support the Emerald Isles, or at least some generic in singular there's, there's Celtic fantasy land. The short of involved Pink Panther, trying to steal a pot of gold from the Leprechaun, or ever the recurring little man, character obsessed as one. As the Pink Panther was walking over like a rainbow, like a bridge, a storm cloud caused it to disappear from under his feet. While he fell, and there was a sickening crunch sound. The Pink Panther was shown bleeding out of the ground, bones jutting out, and then he saw a Leprechaun's pot crawled over on top of it. Despite his injuries, the smile of victory fell across his face. He peered down in the pot and the leprechaun appeared from behind and pushed him in, closing the lid over him and then roasting him alive over the fire. The episode then ended with the sound of Pink Panther screaming. Lame, I thought. Someone basically just took Pink Panther cartoon and gave it a little itchy and scratchy treatment. It was some sort of disturbing of whoever did it, clearly had the access to the original animation resources to make it look like it was actually a real episode. But overall, it was underwhelming com compared to what I think I was expecting. The next item was a copy of The Lion King. It was time for a proper factory copy with the retail jacket. The man told me the movie itself was normal, but there was a special animated short at the end of the tape with the psychologic properties. He warned me that the experience was far more worse than the Pink Panther tape, and even asked me if I had heart conditions. Despite his warnings, I insisted on going through with this. He refused to fast forward the short to the short, saying that he wants to keep the tapes from warping even though through he had the footage of the digitally archived. After the credits, there were some special features, including some animated shorts that I have never seen before. When a title card appeared, the short called The Lion, the man then paused for a moment, 
and again and asked if I was sure to proceed, which I nodded and he played. The short we featured was apparently a version of Scar, but the art style was completely different. It was a 2D animation, but somehow was much more realistic than the Pixar animation. It's hard to explain. It wasn't like CGI realism, but there was so much detail and effort put into the character that it gave the impression of realism while still being paradoxically fantastical. The clip then showed Scar walking around the white background before stopping to the viewer. The camera then began zooming in slowly on his face and his eyes began glowing red, threatening. Jungle music began playing. Suddenly I became very nervous. A vicious grimace emerged over Scar's face, like a kind of predator makes before striking. His mouth opened wide, showing rows of sharp teeth, and I heard realistic growling sounds. His face wrinkled in the pattern of consists with the face of a lion makes before pouncing. My nervousness turned into terror. My gaze was fixed, transfixed on the screen, and I couldn't look away. I knew it was only animated, and even though the lion couldn't get to me through the screen, I was paralyzed as if I was facing a real predator. I was in a trance, but not until it break when Scar jumped and I screamed for my life. I kept screaming until the man shook me out of it. Sorry about that, he said. I, but I did warn you. Once I got my ear bearings back, I asked for the next item. He gave me a puzzled look, as if he expected me to just to give up and go home after the last tape. But he shrugged and got the next one. It was another home VHS la tape labeled Super Bowl 2000. This was the next one that won't do anything to you like the lion video, but it is disturbing of what it shows in the video. In fact, I'll just tell you what it is. The tape shows a lot of riot that did not happen. If you don't know, there was no sports at the riot during the 2000 Super Bowl. Certainly not in the stadium itself, but the tape shows that all is it. Once again, the man refuses to skip the interesting part to preserve the integrity of the tape. In the third quarter, he made, the referee made a call that wouldn't sit well with the tr Titans fans. Someone that threw a beer bottle, more people started throwing things, and it escalated to a full-scale riot, which spectators swarmed around the field and attacked each other. You could even see the majority of the crowd slowly evacuating the, the venue, while small but determined segments began vandalizing the place, having a spectatoric ball brawls. There were no commentary at this point, just the raw stadium footage that cycled through the various venue cameras. About 20 minutes into the riot, the tape ended. The tape did not cost me to have any experience to object terror like the last one. In fact, the riot had been in bad to compare to other sports riots that I have seen. I also, but I found it disturbing on a deeper level. The fact that they could all, after the recording of all the sports events, just to make it show something so blandly that it didn't really happen, it didn't really, in reality, it terrified me. They can only have done it to, in two different ways, with editing techniques that were well beyond publicly known to the world, or even some type of magic. I still asked to see the next item. And the man said that this was the last one, and it was a plug-in-and-play video game. This time, the man explained that the Lost Media Group was also known to dabble on some other mediums besides movies and televisions. In particular, they were said to produce a lot of lost video games, though this was only the only one he had been able to acquire. The game was labeled Pokemon Black Carbonite. I actually remembered hearing about Nintendo making a Pokemon plug-in and play game, but that was cancelled. But I didn't know that because of the title. The thing was black and a boar of white image of Pikachu sporting on the menacing grin. I'm not going to let you play this. I myself will pl never play it again. This thing will mess you up and downright dangerous. You can examine the hardware though. I took it from him and did so. The first thing I noticed upon closer inspection was a fissure of the control pad. There was a lot of force that had to be applied to take a crack. Then I noticed that some of the plastic was warped and melted. I looked at the man and he gave me a look back for my understanding and said that there was nothing more than needed to be said. He handed the game back to him. 
The man then said some goodbye to formalities and his hand over my shoulder and aggressively led me to the door, closing it and locking behind me. He never... He never saw my camera during the lion short, so I managed to snap at least a quick digital photo of the TV screen while the man wasn't looking, and I put the camera back away before the whole bad acid trip thing. I had the photo enlarged for the intents to study it, and it was still frightening, even without the psychological properties of the animated short. Again, despite the certain cartoon, it had such a detailed realism that it seemed to be more alive than I thought a cartoon would.